cultural silence around Okurawuli. Not only that cultural silence, but it is arguably state-imposed silence. Okay? And this silence, again, is characterized by the failure to honor the dead. This is the problem. The cultural silence, the failure to honor the dead. That is the problem. Now, the, the, this problem, this bigger problem, leads to sub problems. What are the sub problems? And who are they affected? The sub problems is what has been referred to. Um, you know, the economic problems that we're having today, the fragmentation of the society, the bleeding that is going on, you know. And the problem of 1980 to 1987 affect, affected the dead. Not only that, I think Reverend would agree with me that even God does not uh, rejoice over anybody who kills another person. So we have got the dead as a stakeholder. We have got the living, and I believe the others who are going to talk about the living. We have got the victims. The victims in the community. The victims that are here. And we have got the witnesses those that saw. We also have the perpetrators. And um, certainly when we look at this uh, conflict, the Gokurahun conflict, the perpetrators, some of them are dead, but some are still around. And not just around, some of them are in the corridors of power. Then we have got the future generation. The future generation, these are the people who are living today and those that are coming after us. How are they going to fare? How are they going to live in the context of this problem? So, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is the state-imposed cultural silence and the failure to honor the dead. Now, let's get into concepts that probably may situate us into a discussion. Uh, when we're talking of uh, concept, we want to define what is Kukura Wundi. Others have tried to define it uh, from uh, the Shona rain-making ceremony. But let me go to what I think should uh, be added into the definition of Kukura Wundi. It is a terrible period a terrible period of state apparatus. See, uh, state apparatus, extreme repression, brutal acts, and extreme violence against a group of people who are housed under the name Debe. Okay. Amongst the Debe, we cannot reconstruct the Debe, but we have got ethnical groups within the Debe. And then we we are saying Gokurawan is when the state used apparatus, right? State apparatus to commit acts of repression, brutal acts, and extreme violence against this group of people. This is my conceptual definition of Gokurawan. Then honoring the dead, what do we mean by honoring the dead? When I was, you know, coming up with this presentation, I, I asked myself, what is honoring the dead? I had several debates within myself. But let's agree that it is treating the dead or regarding them with special attention and respect. Giving them respect. Giving them attention. When I defined Gokura Wanda, I talked of violence. I talked of um, violence against a group uh, called the Debele. And we also have uh, terms that we find in peace studies, such as positive peace, negative peace, 
from 1987 up to now, we have got what is called negative peace. We may not have bombs, we may not have bullets, but we don't have peace. That is peace in the negative. So it's called negative peace. But probably what we are gathering for is a shift or a move towards what is called positive peace. This is a situation whereby we take note of our differences, we live together in peace and in harmony. This is what we want to move towards. So let's take note of what is called negative peace and positive peace. And from 1988, we have what is peace in the negative. You may say, no, the elections were free and fair, things are okay, but that's negative peace according to John Gautam. Okay. Then we've got what is called the structural, cultural, direct and indirect violence. Structural violence is the one that I referred to, where the state uses its power to commit acts of violence against a society. That is called the structure of violence. It has evolved over time. From 1980 to 1987, it was against an ethnic group called the Lebele. But from 1987 to dead, we can talk of structural violence in economical terms, whereby the state uses its apparatus against defenseless citizens, against defenseless, defenseless people of Zimbabwe. That's, again, another issue that we can talk about structural violence. Then we've got direct and indirect violence. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, uh, let me also talk about uh, the post-conflict scenario after 1987, revisiting Gokura What is it that has been happening? Okay. We have, um, can we go there or not? Concepts. Mm -hmm. There is a slide of concepts, concepts and theories. Yeah, okay, thank you. We've got number five, the the post-conflict scenario. We are faced with the two options as a nation. Either we prescribe or we go through the elicitive approach. The prescriptive approach is led by the state. And the state determines what has to be done, how it has to be done, who has to be part of the process of the post-conflict scenario. It is prescriptive. It is as good as someone who is sick and has gone to see a doctor. And if, and if you tell the doctor that my leg is aching, he gives you Panadol for the stomach. There is a problem because it is prescriptive and you don't question the doctor because the doctor is the one in charge. Ladarak also talks of elicitive approach. The elicitive approach is one that I am preferring as I talk about the post-COVID scenario, whereby issues come from the community, issues come from the society. We elicit what has to be done from the community and not from the state. We are saying the people of Geology, the people of Gokwe, they have to input into the post-conflict intervention. Next slide. Then, Again, there is what is called the conflict cycle. Generally, it's, you know, there's a lecture sometimes when you teach students, you try to be complicated. But simply, there are three stages before the conflict, during the conflict, and after the conflict. And the first stage is the one before the conflict, where we have the state unleashing its apparatus against the people. Then we've got the war torn people where conflict has destroyed these people. Then we've got the post-conflict uh, period. These are the three stages in a conflict cycle. And then uh, when we are talking of the post-conflict uh, cycle and the last stage, which is the post-conflict uh, stage, we've got peaceful actors, such as the Baba Christian Alliance uh, Reverend such as priests, uh, such as many organizations that are here, 
these are peaceful actors uh, who have a mandate and a trust and an interest around issues to do with peace. Uh, my good doctor referred to the Rwanda case, the Gachacha. Uh, it was a traditional elicitive culture-driven approach where the society had to agree on what had to be discussed. We, we, we will spend the whole day here. But that's the conflict cycle. And where are we? We are at that stage of the post-conflict. And in the post-conflict uh, period, from Zimbabwe, from 1980 to date, it has been prescriptive. And it has failed to yield healing amongst the people. Um, there are scholars who have uh, presented what they think need to be done in a post-conflict scenario. We have moved to the post-conflict scenario. The first and the most important thing is the truth, which is acknowledgement of wrong. Because we are talking of um, what we referred to as acts, brutal acts against a group of people. So there must be the truth. There is no truth. The truth is with the community. It is not with the state. So the first stage is to get the truth. How do we go about the truth? That's why Dr. Fire was talking of uh, the communities, but also academics uh, coming into the equation to carry out an adulterated research data collection, getting information from the grassroots, from the people. Then from there, once the truth has been an end, a validation of painful loss and experiences, we, 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 we jump to the issue of mess. On the issue of mess, I think Reverend will say, we'll talk about it, because it is personal. <laughs> This is what is talked about in church. Please forgive. The, the capacity to forgive lies with the person who he has been preached to. The same as the capacity to repent. Okay, now let's jump to point number three, which is justice. We're talking of post conflict justice, uh, vindication of individual group rights while advocating for restitution and social reconstruction. So the, the, the post-conflict justice, post kokorahong justice is still elusive, still not there. Because the perpetrators, some of them are known, some are not known, but they are working squat free in Zimbabwe. So when we want to talk of justice, we first unearth the truth and allow it to fit into the courts and justice is rendered. We are saying 42 years after independence, we have not honored the dead. How many years? 42 after independence. And still, we are, we are not honoring. We are doing other things, but we are not honoring them. And the issue of honoring the dead, as you are going to see from the three case studies in the global taking lessons from the global period. Honoring the dead cannot be driven by the state. Each community, each nation has its own way of honoring its dead. Now, the 2013 constitution, I'm happy we have the NPRC, we have got the Human Rights Commission. These are const uh, the commissions that are part of our constitution who have a mandate to look at the issue that we are debating today. I'm glad NPRC, <laughs> my own analysis justice, uh, is that when NPRC started this way, they were okay. But along the way, something happened. That's my view, my personal view. When they started this way, it was a bit better. But along the way, something happened. There was a bit of some interference and uh, redirection 
realignment. And again, we left the elicitive approach and went into the prescriptive. That's my view. Second Republic opportunity. It is uh, the Second Republic. It has its own policies, NDS1, and, and, and the, the one that will come after NDS1 is called NDS2. It's coming. <laughs> so we, we have got Agenda 2030. It's coming. And these uh, policy blueprints, they also refer to ensuring that we meet SDG 16. We are debating this, we are meeting this in line with the sustainable development goal number 16, which talks of peace, justice, and establishing strong institutions. So we are at the first thing, peace and justice. We need peace, we need justice. Let's move, sir. Okay. How are they dead or not? We have got what is called the Gayatra amongst the Yundu people. They have got eight days of procession. Procession. They have their mombes, the cows. They allow them to walk the streets of Blaue. What is their cultural approach to honoring the dead for eight days annually? Nothing will be happening in the, amongst the Hindu. That's how they do. Then coming back to Ghana, they've got that, the Adikra, Konzokoso, that one. They've got their own way of honoring the dead. Then from Malaysia, we've got, there are quite many case the examples, uh, you know, of how the dead are honored. Next slide. These are just a college of pictures that shows how it's done in some cases. I know some are scared, but this is how they do it in their cultures. Next slide. Okay, uh, concerning the issue at hand, we have got those that were short dead, typologies of deaths, short dead, those that were dead, those that were night, those that were tortured to death, uh, they are dead. They are, uh, those, that are, that, those that were abducted and those that disappeared. We don't know where they are up to today. They were taken away. Witnesses are there. Victims are there. And among us, the debate, there is a ceremony called Upiso, which is the ceremony to honor the dead. How do we honor the dead whom we do not know where they are? So this is where the problem is. Next slide. Approaches to honoring the dead. We've got about four approaches in our presentation. The culture-centered approach, this is the one that I prefer. It is elicitive. It involves the people and is guided by the cultures of the people. And uh, I have submitted that among us, we've got different ethnical groups. So we, we, we need to get the ideas from Biva. We need to get the ideas in the Midlands, where I come from, from Bok. Their culture, it must be uh, inculcated or integrated in their approach. The theological approach, church-led approach, theological approach, it has more to do with the church leading the way, um, being guided by the, by the Bible. But unfortunately, within the theological aspect, there are other churches that do not believe in the Bible. There are divisions within the church spectrum. But in terms of uh, uh, ethics and the direction to take, normally the church has had successes. Then the governance and development approach. Well, this one is to come up with some developmental approach. It is also a bit prescriptive because we learn from institutions that have done that and we learn from the Western discourse in terms of what is governance and what is development. That's why Cloud Ake would talk of democratization of the development debate. To say, let us come up with our own way of saying this is good governance, this is development. The sustainable development approach, it talks of the SDG 16, which I alluded to. Uh, on options, uh, there are options within the conflict discourse, conflict resolution, conflict management, and conflict transformation. The number four is peace building. Conflict resolution is about ending the conflict. It's absolute, you cannot end the conflict. We have got the conflict management whereby we are saying, no, let's try to manage what is there. But there is, there is an expired debt of your management styles. <laughs> as, 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 as generations evolve, you cannot manage and stifle 
the voice of the people forever. Then conflict transformation is transforming the conflict. Then number four, that's where we are. Peace building, that is the current. And uh, we need to reconstitute the structures, the peace sectors. And uh, Dr. Fire talked of the integration of the intellectuals into this agenda. It's very important. But we also need to find other peace sectors. Not necessarily the intellectual, not, not only the civil side organizations. There are other actors that must be involved. We, we, we take note that NPRC has integrated chiefs and we are happy to have uh, the deputy chief, but there are also other actors within the communities. Data gathering I talked about, truth and acknowledgement, justice, which is restorative, is what probably can be talked about. Then peace building interventions. We need to carry on with peace building interventions. In conclusion, my submission is simple. The dead need to be honored. Honoring the dead helps the living. I think there are presentations to talk about the living, meaning the living. Then economic development, it becomes a problem if we have not addressed this peace issue, this conflict issue. Let's have some progress as a nation towards SDG 16. Uh, if we are serious about uh, sustainable development. Then let's talk about these issues. Thank you.